HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. So you don't shun the devil with your rock and roll load. Knows that country music's gonna save your soul. The devil runs his groove in them rhythm and blues that sound. It's gonna get you sound in the end. Welcome back to The Speakeasy. I'm Damon Bolte. I'm Southern Teague. And I'm Greg Benson. Hey, buddy. Hey guys, uh, checking out any new restaurants lately, or any old new restaurants? I I checked out a very new old restaurant recently, actually. So I was this past weekend visiting my sister in Central Pennsylvania, Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, uh, just outside of Hershey, and we went to one of the oldest restaurants in the country. It's oh. a place called the Horse Inn. Uh, it's actually built in an old oh, yeah. elevated horse stable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 pretty well known for being a place that's just like on the middle of a residential street in a relatively, let's call it generously third tier market city. <laughs> and every time I go out there for a visit, I always try to make a point to go because their cocktails are fucking fantastic. Their food is great. And it's a nice little uh, serving of humble pie for me. And I think all of us, uh, when we tend to think of just, you know, your major markets like New York, L.A., Vegas and Chicago, even some of like the smaller places, smaller places like Houston and Phoenix as being like the only spots where you can go and get great cocktails. It's nice as a reminder that, you know, not only are we living in an era where, as we famously say on the show a lot, you can get a Negroni at Applebee's, you can find people who are doing really cool, awesome stuff at places that are, you know, just cities that ordinarily you would pass by on the highway without giving a second thought. So it was, it was delicious. If you're ever in Lancaster, check it out. <laughs> Happy accidents. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I, I, there wasn't anything there before that, you know, like and being able to forage your own stuff and like make your own spirits. I mean, like there's, you know, I keep, I refer to this a lot. Um, the day that I saw an, uh, an issue of in by magazine where it was probably like 2009 or 10 or something like that. And it, the feature cities were not LA, New York, Chicago, the aforementioned cities, uh, but it was like St. Louis and Kansas city. And so, yeah, I mean, it's like to go to Lancaster and find a good cocktail or, or not just good cocktail, a great cocktail, as you said, um, I think you said fucking great. Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> um, if not, I'm amending my statement now yeah. to say fucking great. Yeah. Well, I want to yeah. roll back and say it seems to me that that's pretty interesting <laughs> in that you're talking about a place that's been around forever. And normally when, when – like I was just in L.A. and I went to Taylor, which is a, a steakhouse that's been there since 1953. It's kind of trapped in time in both decor and like menu offerings and in price, which I really enjoyed, right? The price was mm-hmm. like basically half of what I would expect to pay for what we got there. But the cocktails weren't good they were standard cocktails, you know, you got your, your, I got a Gibson, there was Manhattans, but I saw them, you know, they were shaking their Manhattans, the, whatever, if that's the way they've been doing it since 1953, that's fine. Um, but nothing innovative and new. Are you saying this place of old had a f- sort of fresh current cocktail menu? I'll say this. The last time that I was there, I had a cocktail that had banana liqueur and fernet in it, and it was fucking right. delightful. Right. Yeah. And any anyone that's got a mad scientist okay. who's willing to like look at those two bottles side by side and be like, you know what? Like that is that is a place that's that's pretty innovative. And the other thing that's yeah. cool about it is because Lancaster is 
all due apologies to the people that live there, but I think they're aware of this kind of in the middle of nowhere. You're surrounded by farmland. The reason my sister lives out there is she's a, a, a horse doctor, a veterinarian. She's the smart one. I'm the funny one. Um, and <laughs> you have all of these amazing fresh fruits and vegetables and, uh, you know, steaks, uh, all different kinds of meat that are grown around there. And here in New York City, if a place has, you know, sourced their stuff from the Hudson River Valley or somewhere close to here or somewhere that's doing like, you know, small local farming, they'll make a big fucking deal about it on their menu because that's rare here. It's so much easier to get your stuff from, you know, uh, uh, what's it called? Cisco or whatever. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, than to actually source it from somewhere close to where your restaurant is, which is a bananas facet of, you know, modern infrastructure and capitalism, but okay. But over there, it's just kind of taken for granted. Like in a place like Lancaster, it's kind of taken for granted that, yeah, the strawberries that we're using in this came from a farm that's 20 minutes away, because why would we source from California? That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. It's right there and it's all delicious. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, yep. whenever I'm in, in different towns, I try and seek out the sort of old guard, the, especially when it's time to dine, the old guard, the spot that's been around forever, the place that's known to all the locals. And that's how we wound up at Taylor in L.A. And it was great, a great experience. But I do find that when I go to those places, it's generally not the place to have, you know, inventive, modern cocktails. You're sort of, again, sort of trapped in time. So it's that's cool to hear. I mean, maybe if I find myself in Lancaster, I'll... I'll wind my way into the horse. <laughs> the horse. You should yeah. absolutely, absolutely wind your way into the horse and do some horsing around. So you, so you took your sister, the horse uh, surgeon, to to the to the restaurant uh, called the horse. <laughs> Actually, she tipped me off to its existence, which honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, shouldn't surprise me in the least. But here we are. Yeah. Well, anyway, speaking of incredibly intelligent women, yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That was that was a that was such a lame segue, even by our standards here on the Speakeasy. We'll do better next week. That was great. One. That was great. Uh, but just speaking of cool people. Oh, speaking of doctors, there here we, we go. go. Yeah, let's loop that in. Yeah, exactly. Uh, joining us in the studio today, <laughs> we have Doctor Nicola Nice, who's here to talk about her new book, The Cocktail Parlor, which I am super excited to read and talk to you about today. Nicola, thank you so much for coming back on the show. It's always great to see you. Yeah third time thank you yeah thanks for having me it's starting to feel like a, an old comfy leather chair um, talking to you guys just settle back in yeah that's the, the imprint is still there from the last time you were hanging yeah, out that's yes. <laughs> um so talk to us a little bit about the the background of this book because this is something that I think even the last time you were on the show, you were working on uh, a project that kind of became this project, mm -hmm. if I'm remembering right. Yes, that's right. This is this is something that I'll say has been in the making probably for, for close to a decade because it's, you know, I think much like a lot of first books, it's something that kind of started as a hobby and then that hobby turned into a passion and then the passion sort of turned into a mission and there was just you skipped this, obsession uh, obsession comes obsession, in there somewhere <laughs> right exactly <laughs> uh, a very dangerous obsession to my credit card sure. um, but yes so i think you i think you know this about me because we've talked about this before but i've always had this sort of burning question in my mind of what have women had to say about the cocktail over the over the the generations? Um, and this sort of stems back to my early fascination with the cocktail when I first moved to New York uh, back in the early two thousands. By day, working with brands as a commercial sociologist to help them decode consumer behavior and drinking trends, and by night participating in those drinking behaviors and <laughs> trends and, and wanting to know everything about where the cocktail came from. And when I first started doing where, what every researcher does, when even the professional ones, when you start a research project, you Google <laughs> uh, what is what the history of the cocktail or most important books on the cocktail that I should read, you know, as a starting place. And finding that every time I did that search, I was getting a similar sort of list of 
books by men about men who were serving drinks and bars primarily to men, which mm-hmm. undoubtedly has been an important driving force in where the cocktail has come from. Um, but I always had this hypothesis that maybe that was only half the story or perhaps even only a third of the story. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is because even today, two-thirds of our drink consumption happens in the home um, and not in in bars and not necessarily documented in bar guides. So this initial hobby was, I wonder if I can find um, the sort of resources that maybe my grandmother or great-grandmother or great-great-grandmother might have used when she was looking for recipes to serve to guests in the home. So that was sort of initially where it started. And as I said, this this turned from a few books into a very large collection, (laughs) over 200 (laughs) at this point. Um, And as I started to lay those books out side by side on my expanding bookshelves, I realized there's there's a story here. Um, There's a story that is not just the story of the cocktail, but it's the story of women and and women's emancipation and their relationship with their domestic life versus their public and social life. And there's also a story just in terms of how we host and and where we host um, in our houses. So that was sort of where the kernel of the idea came from. And then this this culminated in a connection with Robert Simonson of the New York Times, who found out about my collection and being an obsessive collector himself, was interested in the story and and, and published um, a, a, an interview with me in the Times, I think back in, I think in 22. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that sort of one thing led to another and and, and I was approached by a number of agents who who suggested, yes, there really is a story here. Um, and so I thought, you know what? Fuck it, I'll write it down. Um, and, and that's what <laughs> I did. We'll do that... live. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you broke the seal on that, Greg, so I thought that would be an acceptable oh, yeah. um, turn of phrase there. Uh, but that's the background to it. I mean, I understand that that's what you do, right? That's what the modern person does. The beginning of research is a quick Google search. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you think that it was just uh, that it's – I guess what I'm trying to say is how did you notice that there was something hidden? I get get noticing that there was something missing. It was all men. There's something missing here. There are more than just men, right? Um, But how did you notice there was something hidden? Because I don't know that I would have thought to myself, you know, maybe I'm not searching the right thing. Maybe cocktails, cocktail book, cocktail history. The word cocktail is probably the wrong thing. It's it's hosting that it really comes down to, right? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think much like with you know anything when it comes to sort of the historical record, often these things are hidden in plain sight, mm-hmm. right? You know, it was it was there all the time. But to your point, we weren't necessarily looking in those places. We weren't necessarily looking to a household management guide or an etiquette guide or a guide to entertaining to find advice on how to mix drinks. And to your point, the books themselves were not necessarily directly about cocktails, although some of them were. But in order to find them, yeah, it, it took some sleuthing. Um, it took much, uh, much like any type of research, you you go down a rabbit hole, right? So you find one writer and that writer makes reference to another writer. And then you find a newspaper article about you know, that book or that person. And then there's a reference to something else. Um, and that's how it sort of opens the Pandora's box. So you're looking at these books that are all about hosting. Are, is that even kind of a common book today, that sort of genre or category? Or have we kind of branched it off to be like cocktail book, cookbook, um, home decor book, whereas maybe those things used to be kind of all under one cover, right? Yeah, I think that we have got more segmented. I mean, obviously, there is way more, there are way more publishers, there are way more ways to to publish and, and segment the content now as um, there were, you know, maybe wasn't 100, 150 years ago. I think so. the The book is a the book tells the story of the cocktail through the words of a hundred women who have written about it. So, basically, it is this idea that I said that there's a there's a bibliography of of a hundred books, um, and the the cocktail parlor, the book, 
tells the story of that library, if you like, and the evolution. Um, and so you can see as you go through the chapters that there's an evolution in the type of women who were writing about drinks, why they were writing about drinks, who their assumed audience was. And there's an evolution from, you know, in the very beginning, a focus on domestic management, mm -hmm. where making drinks and making ingredients for drinks was just part of the wider system of looking after the home uh, through to obviously, you know, you've got mid-century, uh, mid-20th century, where it's just an emphasis on the cocktail party um, specifically and what how to hold a party. And then I think probably from the 80s onwards, it's really more a focus on entertaining and the lifestyle of entertaining. And then as we come to present day, obviously, with the renaissance of interest in the cocktail, we have a lot more that's specifically about drinks and cocktails. Right. And I think the fascinating thing to me is like I, I watched, uh, you know, the, I'm current on the seasons of The Gilded Age. I love that show. Mm -hmm. I love it mostly for like all the costuming and set, set design. But um, it's the women who are running these very fancy parties, dinner parties, cocktail parties, et cetera, they are making all the decisions. They're talking to the chef and saying what we're going to eat. They're talking to their, you know, butler about what we're going to drink. So what you're saying is like back then and still today that you're posting that women make most of the decisions for what's drank at home. Is that still correct? Yeah. Is that, am I reading that right? Yes. I, I mean, I, I, a phrase that I often use is that women are the chief entertainers of the home. Right. Um, so there's a quote at the beginning of the book from um, the early 20th century interior designer Elsie de Wolf uh, that says, um, you know, men, you know, w women are um, the, the sort of owners of the home. Men will forever be the guests. Um, hmm. And I think there is something in this idea. And, and it, it goes back to to re yeah, to really the early days and uh, there's the separation between public and private life, which was something that the Victorians sort of really um, instilled. And to your point about the Gilded Age, this is where it went to kind of extreme levels, mm -hmm. where it was not just about women looking after the home. It was about women using their private life, right, um, their private world so the world outside of commerce and the outside of politics as a way to build social status for the family and that is absolutely what the gilded age yeah. the show it's all about. is all about yeah a little bit a little bit catty in a way um yeah. <clears throat> but you know fun to watch uh, mm -hmm. uh especially you know it's all here in new york and i live here in new york um so I, i'm gonna ask what seems to be a painfully obvious question maybe but uh, for our listener it might be enlightening and the job that you do when you work for brands, is it to angle the marketing more towards women? If women are making so many choices for the home, it seems like that's obviously who you need to market towards. Well, yes, I think, but, you know, through my career as a sociologist and also as an entrepreneur, I've, I've felt that there has been money being left on the table yeah. by not taking women seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that, that's, you know, at the end of the day, it's sort of viewing it more from a commercial opportunity um, side of things or, and obviously a marketing opportunity. And then through the, through the writing here, it's really about setting the academic record straight. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's fascinating. I can't wait to get a hold of the book um, and, and check it out uh, because, I, because obviously I, I'm, I, I guess I don't, I don't realize how much I'm slightly into this topic, right? Like I really enjoy that show. Um, I've now been turned, someone has turned me on to uh, Downton Abbey, which is, I guess, kind of the similar situation. Oh, um, but I haven't checked oh it. you're about to go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> I haven't my checked friend. it out yet. That's what I heard also. So I'm kind of like being cautious about it. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I, I'm excited to get a hold of the book, uh, The Cocktail Parlor. Um, talk about a little bit about, um, if you can, you've got a, well, I guess you can. It's a free bonus chapter to the book that you can download once you pre-order um, that's specific to New York, right? 
Yes, yes. Um, so, and and you you alluded to this uh, talking about the Gilded Age and obviously being set in New York. But as I was as I was writing the book and I was drawing on all of these resources, I realized how many not just the books, but obviously the publishing world was here, mm -hmm. the cocktail world was here. I say here because I'm in New York too. Um, so there was a lot of a lot of content being being written and published in New York, but it wasn't just about the books. It was about diving into the stories of the women who wrote them, right? And so many of their stories started or ended or came through New York at some point. So much much like this idea of spin-offs and, um, and rabbit holes, I always kind of felt in the back of my mind, oh, there's, there's something here that's just sort of interesting. If I was walking through the streets of New York, where could I stop in for a drink today? Or what buildings would I pass that would, would have this sort of untold history about mm -hmm. them that um, I could go and explore? So I wrote an additional chapter to the book, which is, it's a tour guide. So it's a guide to the city. Um, it's obviously not the whole city. It starts on the Upper East Side and it goes all the way down to Tribeca. So it's about it's about a mile, I suppose. You can walk it in a, in a couple of hours. If you're stopping for drinks, it might take you a little bit longer. Um, but the idea is, as you as you walk from the Upper East Side down to Tribeca, you walk through about um, five different neighborhoods. And in each of those neighborhoods, I tell a, a story about a particular era um, where some interesting women were doing interesting things um, and were drinking in interesting places. And so if you buy the book or you pre-order the book, um, it's very simple. You can um, go and enter your information and you'll get this this chapter um, get this chapter now and, and 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 download it and go visit some of those places and drink some of the drinks yeah take yourself on a progressively a cool slower edition. walking tour <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm Lou Bank. And I'm Greg Benson. And this is an ad for Ancestral Agave Syrup, the critically acclaimed award-winning syrup that helps gringo bartenders better make margaritas, wait, wait, Negronis, Lou, hold and up, hold up, wait. Old Are you just... Fashions? This is how you start your podcast. What? It's not an ad for Ancestral Agave Syrup. Well, of course it is. I'm just cutting costs by not paying writers to make something new. I'm just using an old script. You pay writers? Is that some kind of jab? No, I'm just saying what, that... What What are you saying? Well, look, we've got this amazing syrup that's made in an ancestral manner, cooked down from the sap of the agave, harvested the way these families would to make pulque. It's a quality product. It deserves yeah, a yeah. quality presentation. Yeah, okay, okay, hang on. <clears throat> ancestral agave syrup is made by real families following traditional methods. Unlike the industrial Blue Weber syrup you get everywhere else, Ancestral is cooked down from Aguamiel, harvested from Salmiana in Hidalgo, Mexico. It is the grade A Vermont maple to the sticky diner syrup you've been using for your cocktails. Ingredients matter both in how your cocktail tastes and how you treat the earth. Ancestral is better for both. Is that good? Uh, sure. Or maybe confusing instead of cheesy. Uh, look, just visit AncestralAgave.com to learn more and to order your world-class agave syrup today. And we'll call that a wrap. Catch you next ad, Greg. Uh, Hasta pronto? Ancestral Agave Syrup. Available online at ancestralagave.org and wherever Greg and Lou are able to coerce store owners into carrying it. Well, I would I would love to hear a little bit more about some of these women because I, when you and I spoke for, uh, I think this is for my other podcast for Back Bar, um, you had mentioned one woman who I had never heard of before, despite the fact that her book, when it was published for many, many years, was the second best selling book in the country, number one being the Bible. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of, that's a, a difficult one to dethrone, but I would love to hear uh, some of the stories that you're highlighting and some of these people that we've just sort of um, 
like like the wonderful city of Lancaster just kind of passed by on the highway of history and not really noticed mm-hmm. before. Yeah. Well, of the hundred um, that are in the book, <laughs> I think that so what the book has a combination of women who you may have heard of, but never thought about them in the context of the cocktail before. Um, and then women who I'm, you know, I'm pretty certain you probably wouldn't have heard of before. And so the, the woman who I think you're referring to is Isabella Beaton, um, who wrote uh, the book of household management. And the, I think the reason why we talked about her before was because that book was so popular that at one point, the only book it didn't outsell was the Bible. And she was really the first uh, major global brand, if you like, when it comes to um, to home entertaining, um, even though she died only a few years after the book came out. Uh, there's an interesting backstory to her life that other people have written about um, in that her husband ended up selling the rights to the book and to her brand to another publisher who then took it global and and, and made an awful lot of money on it. And he <laughs> he died uh, not, <laughs> um, not, not so wealthy and not so well off. Um, but mm. she introduced this idea of the way that Isabella wrote was was very much sort of instructional guide. So she loved to, and the Victorians loved to do this, to, to categorize and classify things. So her, the way she thought about drinks was to classify them. And she put them into to three distinct categories. Um, one were um, plain beverages, basically hot beverages like tea and coffee that were not fermented. Um, the second were essentially um, carbonated drinks, so drinks that had had um, carbonation added to them. And then the third were um, were drinks made from fermented ingredients, you know, meaning, meaning alcohol. Um, and uh, the reason why I think that she was interesting is because even though there were no, no cocktail recipes, there is a, the American mint julep, um, which is a whole other side story that I cover in the book as well. In that book, um, there weren't a ton of cocktail, co- what we would think of as cocktail recipes, um, but certainly there were there were cups and wine cups um, that got, were popular in the UK before they became popular in the US. And uh, in the Gilded Age, in particular, it was the wine cup that women really grasped onto and became kind of the centerpiece of the way they entertained. Um, And then that entertainment that had the wine cup at the center of it then sort of really became the, the, the starting point for the cocktail party. So one of the things that I was particularly interested in exploring in the book is how did the cocktail party start? I mean, we can all associate cocktail parties with the 20s, right? And we all know that everyone was having them. And then by the 50s, it became the American way of entertaining. Um, But no one has sort of, no one's really answered that question of who, not just who had the first one, there's, um, there's, there's newspaper article about the supposed first cocktail party in 1917. Um, uh, The hostess was Clara Bell Walsh. But it doesn't start with one party, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it starts with a change in behavior. So I wanted to understand what that change in behavior was that ultimately led to the cocktail party and then also answer the question of why did we stop having cocktail parties? Um, and the answer to this is um, feminism. So the first cocktail party started because of first wave feminism um, and because of the struggle that you alluded to in that was happening in the Gilded Age of women actually starting to become frustrated that they had all of this social power, but they had no political power. Mm. Um, And so they started to, one way to, to, to engage more in, in men's world was to bring drinks into the home more and have men doing more of their business in the home. And then second wave feminism in the sixties is what killed the cocktail party. So just one of the many themes um, that is, a rabbit hole away from the original question you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds like uh, it's, a, it's the, the theme to be uh, another book or at the very least mm-hmm. continued writing, um, yeah. which it looks like you're doing now. You have a new blog called The Hostess Diaries mm-hmm. um, where you continue to pick at this and dig into, you know, what what uh, what women's role is in this in this whole thing, plus some 
Uh, my notes here say he's an unconventional approach to traditional bar and restaurant review. You want to talk a little bit about that? I would love to. So <laughs> That's why we're um, here. It's the radio. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. So obviously in writing this book, I, I wanted to write the book in a way that would just be a taster, right? I, I, I don't want to bore people with you know, a book about my library. I wanted to tell a story of the cocktail that would give lots of places for people to go and and dig on their own and 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 go and source some of these materials for themselves. But inevitably, so many themes came out during writing this book that, yeah, not just additional chapters. I I I ha- my personal fascination is not going to go away, and I need a place to put it all. But one of the ideas that sort of continues to go around my head is this sort of idea of how we welcome people or how we make people feel welcome. And obviously, hospitality is the business or commercial version of that. And I think that sometimes that idea gets lost when we're so focused on what we're eating and drinking, and not on how we're made to feel in that moment. So I had this idea to to review bars and restaurants based on their hospitality as opposed to, and obviously what they serve as part of that. Um, and so I'm in the process now undercover um, of beginning some of those reviews and um, I'm excited to start um, over time putting them up onto the blog. So what have you been finding as you, as you work on this? Like what is the... Because it seems to me like this is a whole new way of just thinking about these third spaces in in general. It's actually attempting to quantify or at least, uh, you know, subjectively quantify something that we've all just sort of accepted as in in the ether around these places, but have never actually, uh, you know, taken the time, I think, to to write down. Like we all we all love our favorites because of the vibe. But I don't know that I've ever actually sat down and intellectualized my way through, okay, what did I like about this particular vibe? Why do I like this vibe? How is this vibe different from this other vibe that I also like? What what have you been, I guess, discovering about yourself as you've yeah. been going down this this journey? Yeah, um, so much. I mean, obviously, the, you know, the researcher in me is not just interested in, you know, what was one particular experience, but once I've, you know, once I've had many of them, what's the sort of, what are the kind of meta themes that that go across them? But, you know, I can talk about some of the the sort of individual, very personal experiences I've had. Like, so for example, um, there was a, there, there, I had an experience recently where I was in, and sometimes I would go alone and sometimes I go with others because I want to sort of understand, you know, what's the difference in how, you know, you're, you're treated if you're by yourself or with other people or in a party and so on. And in this particular instance, um, I, I was actually with my husband um, and we were having a very emotional conversation about something um, and I got a little tearful. And um, about uh, two minutes later, our server came over and just very quietly handed me a napkin. Didn't say anything, do anything, you know, and it, it, it just kind of made me realize how much in this particular establishment the people cared about the, you know, not just th- that you were enjoying the food and drink, but what was the actual experience you were having and how can they, you know, offer that sort of, that sense of, um, you know, warmth, right? Um, that that in that moment, and and you know, an alternative way to have treated that moment would have been to just completely ignore it or whatever. But this sort of sense of, you know, this 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 warmth and generosity, which if I was in someone's home, I, you know, I, I might have expected that empathy as well, but I did not expect it mm-hmm. um, in that particular. So right. a lot of these like very small um, moments are, 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 are what I try to capture. Um, yeah, those magical moments, right? It, especially in that case, yeah, I, I love that because we we definitely think about it's. I can't wait to read some of these reviews because you know it's typically they're very formulaic, right? It's about like what you serve and what the decor the decor is like, and you know hours of operation or whatever, <laughs> you know all the boring details. But like you know when we when we think about like 
say our favorite bartenders. A lot of times I can't tell you what they mm-hmm. made for me, like what kind of drink they made or if, or if it was good or not. I just liked the person and they were taking care of mm-hmm. me and yeah. us. You yeah. know? And so things like that. Yeah. I, you know, that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful, subtle mm-hmm. way of taking care of you in that mm-hmm. moment. That's, that's I, magic. I'm curious. How do you like ex- yeah. extract the two from one another? Because I understand what you're saying is like, that magic moment that Damon talked about, the empathy that you talked about. Uh, and when we talk about hospitality uh, versus sort of service and or the services slash items that are delivered, how, how do we, like if I were at someone's home and they served me burnt dinner, right? It was burnt. It was a catastrophe. Everything went wrong. But the hospitality was great. So I loved going there. It was fine, right? Mm-hmm. Can I get away with having that sort of experience in a, commercial setting where there's a transaction involved you know like there are places that i think i go sometimes that i don't really love what they do but i love them right yeah yeah absolutely and look i mean it obviously hospitality comes in different flavors as well right so there there are some hospitality experiences where you want the ritual of hospitality Mm -hmm. to be dialed up to an extreme and that is you know absolutely part of the the fantasy and the experience of having that. And there are, of course, going to be others where, you know, the hospitality is is about making you feel, um, you know, very, very close and warmly um, attended to. And, and each of those has their place. But I don't know whether that it always goes together with the actual dining experience, right? If it's sort of thought about in the same package, Um I mean, you you would know better than me as as you know you work on the other side. I, I'm coming in from the customer perspective here. Right, right. You're, I think that means we all know worse than you. Yeah, actually. yeah. You're the observer. I mean, we're really... all we're all we've all been staring at the pattern too long to see the 3D mermaid in the middle of it. We just can't <laughs> right. do it. You're the observer. We're the observed yeah. in this uh, scenario. Um, but I do yeah. understand it, you know, and, and we talk about it all the time on the show. Damon and I certainly talk about it a lot about how. You know, uh, there used to be an app. I'm struggling to remember what it was called, but it, it, it would show. It told you who was working where, and it was the whole the motto of the app was, you know, you don't visit bars, you visit bar on the, on the bar, bar, right? You don't visit bars, you visit bartenders. Yeah. Um, and and that rings true to me with this notion of sort of reviewing based on hospitality versus based on the product, right? Mm, mm-hmm. I, I really, yeah. I'm, I'm, my mind is starting to race around about like how many experiences that I've had where maybe the food wasn't up to the expectations or maybe the, um, Mm -hmm. you know, the lighting or the atmosphere weren't, but the feeling that I got was great. So, you know, there's a, there's a return trip that's, that's that's planned Um, before I've even left, you know? Yeah. And I think we've all had the opposite, right. Where we've had something where the, you know, the food has been absolutely stellar, but something in the service has just kind of put you off. Um, I think that's probably the larger of the categories, you know, yeah, (laughs) everything was amazing, but it was yeah cold or stiff or boring or, um, yeah. Yeah. Food was hot. Service was cold. (laughs) (laughs) I had a, um, I have a, um, a girlfriend who was talking to recently who was going out for an anniversary dinner and, and she wasn't able to get reservation. I won't say what the restaurant is, but she wasn't able to get reservations for this very high end, um, New York restaurant, um, in time, but decided to go anyway. And when, when she walked in, they offered her and her husband a seat at the bar to, to have their anniversary meal. And she came away from it and she said, oh, you know, the whole point of the anniversary was to go and have this special meal. And she said, I couldn't have had a more special meal, mm-hmm. actually, than the one I ended up having at the bar. And the reason was, was because of the interaction that they then had with the bartender who took an interest in why they were there and, you know, do what you do as bartenders, mm-hmm. right? Which is, um, you know, which is allow people to to feel at home and feel listened to. And, you know, and she came away saying, I think I'm going to have all my meals at the bar after that because it was that interaction that made it special to her now you know that yeah. right and you probably always <laughs> eat at the bar yeah. but the Almost average always. consumer I, I, i'm so yeah. upset when the bar is too full and i get sad at the table <laughs> but the average consumer yeah, thinks that it's a demotion right that it's a second choice yeah. to go to the bar and i think they don't it's like an unknown unspoken secret right yeah. that actually but it is spoken i think it's painfully mm-hmm. obvious to me and maybe the three of us uh you know like you're you're even from the consumer aspect, your server is captive to you. 
the bartender doesn't leave. Your server walks to the right. table and then walks away from the table, <laughs> right? The bartender yep. is with you from A to Z, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. Well, that's fascinating. And I'm, I'm really intrigued by this whole notion of uh, rating on hospitality first. Mm -hmm. um, but then how does, you know, how do you feel when you can objectively say to yourself, man, I had a great time, man, I had a great interaction, loved those people, I could tell they loved me. But but uh, that soup was way over salted and that uh, that salad was underdressed or what, what have you. Like, how do you justify yourself saying I'm still going to recommend the place and I'm still going to go back? Because I think I think for me and, and, and you use the word objective and I, I don't know if any review is oh, ever sure, that's true. truly objective. Um, I, I, I sort of have the philosophy that I mostly want to share the great experiences and the reasons to go um, as opposed to the reasons not to go. Um, I think I, again, I think I can find that elsewhere. Um, what I don't necessarily have is sort of guidance on, yeah, you know, go and expect to feel this way. Um, and the food was okay. The food was good. <laughs> well, I would also argue, you know, we've had a past guest on um, Mandy, um, your friend Greg, Mandy Neglich, right? And her book mm -hmm. is all about uh, how to taste. And she mm -hmm. talks about how ambiance, color, music, and I'm certain hospitality will flavor the food and drink, right? Yes. Absolutely. Taste is incredibly impressionable, mm -hmm. right? So you can, and I've done this experiment many times. I mean, you can blindfold people and you can give them coffee and tell them it's tea and 80% of the time they won't call you out. Mm -hmm. So you, you've, you're very, you, your taste experience is incredibly easily influenced by your other senses. Well, this this kind of gets back into something that I I was very curious about, especially going back to these um, Gilded Age recipes that we're talking about when, you know, bars were old boys clubs, literally, as opposed to now and just kind of figuratively and and sometimes literally they still are. Um, I, I was wondering, I mean, you know, we're all familiar with uh, Jerry Thomas, the, the, the patron saint of bartenders and all of his, you know, many... Uh, escapades and the recipes that he came up with and how they were very uh, adapted to these sort of very grandiose, um, somewhat over the top, very kind of, uh, you know, intimate yet extravagant places where one was meant to linger, how the cocktails that he designed and championed were kind of geared towards those spaces. I was wondering, looking at some of these recipes, if there's anything you noticed about the recipes in the books from the same era that was sort of fundamentally different. I mean, obviously, I don't think any, maybe someone in one of your books advertise, uh, advised making a blue blazer at home, I would be a bit surprised if that was the case. Uh, that's that's something you do in someone else's property with a, preferably an industrial sprinkler system. But I would be fascinated to learn if there were any sort of common threads that you saw that made these cocktails that were adapted for this different space fundamentally um, different from their their counterparts. Yes. And the answer to that is yes. So I think, first of all, regardless of whether we're talking about Jerry Thomas's time or today or any era in between, the vast majority, the, you know, the thousands of cocktails you can have when you are out in a bar or a restaurant today, um, how you go from that to the maybe three or four that the average person makes at home, right? So what this is also, this book also does is sort of explores the evolution of that home menu. Right. So what are the sort of three, four drinks of that time that people, despite the hundreds or thousands they could have had if they were drinking out, actually made at home? So the book is also a recipe book. Most of the, the, the recipes are not original. They're there to be intended to be representative of what, you know, what this, after all of this filtering, what ended up on the home menu of, of the time. And I think that there are a couple of themes that um, are consistent through different eras um, and different, different trends in drinking that, um, that, that, that sort of showcase the transition of a drink from the bar to the home. 
So I'd say the first is in terms of simplif simplification of ingredients, right? Simplification of ingredients and um, to an extent also measures. So any cocktail that, and I would argue that this happens also today, right? That any cocktail that requires or calls for, let's say, more than three or four principal ingredients, first of all, and then secondly, something named and obscure that the chances are I don't have, most consumers today, as in any period of time, are really unlikely to, to go and buy that thing to make that one drink, mm -hmm. right? Unless that drink has special meaning to them. So it was served to them in this, in this bar at their amazing anniversary dinner, and they decided, I want to make this my drink and I want to make it at home. That happens occasionally. But for, for the vast majority of people, you know, if, if, I, if I open a cocktail book and I see something and I'm like, oh, I don't have that, I'm not going to make it, right? right? Um, and so you see a simplification in terms of the recipes, um, you know, and, and in terms of the ingredients in the recipes. But the second is, I would say, um, going along with that is an embellishment in terms of the flavor and the presentation. So in terms of the flavor, what you see are variations on a drink that might have, you know, raspberry syrup instead of simple syrup, right? So, you know, you can turn a, a, a bee's knees into a pink lady or, you know, or you can in, into a bramble by just using, mm -hmm. you know, a blackberry syrup, right? So, so you see this consistently in the way that, um, that people adapt. So they take a base recipe and then they show ways that you can adapt the flavor. Um, and that's something that I also, you know, have, have do in the book. But the second is um, in how it gets presented and the, the embellishments and the garnishes and, and so on. So, you know, I think the wine cup is a perfect example of a drink that was obviously served punch style. Um, that was as much about what it looked like as what it tastes like. And, you know, it was full of pineapple rings and and maraschino cherries and 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 citrus wheels and you know and, and sometimes even had like grapes like draped over the side of them right so it becomes as much back to that point about you drink what you see um, and not just what you taste I think that's another theme because and and certainly when you go forward into the the late 20th century and the the era of Martha Stewart, who I feel sort of really brought the signature cocktail, the idea that the cocktail matches the theme, mm -hmm. the theme of the occasion, the mm. personality of the hostess, um, what you're eating and drinking. And you see this convergence between um, almost the appetizer and the cocktail, um, where the cocktail sort of becomes the thing that starts the meal mm -hmm. and therefore is in the theme of the meal. Um, so that, that I think is another um, another big thing that happens consistently. Martha likes her drinks. Yeah, she does. We, <laughs> we all know that. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you think that like <laughs> modern books written by, say, Martha Stewart, maybe sort of specify some garniture on drinks, whereas maybe in the past the drink was, um, as you said, sort of in, in that bowl, sort of overly decorated, and that, that was the individual part, right? Do you think that maybe some of that got taken away because for, for whatever reason? <laughs> Yeah, I think that. Um, so, I, mean, I think the know, reason is people like to be told what to do. <laughs> yeah, I think. So if you say I, make I, this drink yeah. and garnish as you like, they're going to be like, I don't know what to do. So you get to a place where you say make this drink and add grapes and pineapple wheels and maraschino cherries, and that's what they'll Agreed. do. Agreed. Right? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that people like to follow a recipe, um, but if you can show people, here's a really easy way that you could you know, you can customize this recipe. So that's how the recipes are written in the book, actually, that there's, here's the recipe. And then there's a note underneath that says, you know, if you, if you want to jazz up your Collins, like, you know, why not infuse your simple syrup with thyme or something, mm -hmm. or use a lavender garnish or what have you. So you, the basic recipe is there and it's foolproof, but then there are ways that if you, you know, if you are, if you are having a Collins in the winter versus in the summer, um, how are you going to, how, you, how can you sort of adapt that recipe seasonally? Um, so. Yeah. Um, I think that's all very fascinating. I think time has changed those things in ways that we, uh, at first blush don't, don't really glom onto. And uh, obviously during all your research and having hundreds of books to pour over, I'm sure you saw like the needle sort of move to the other direction where it's a little bit more exact exacting mm -hmm. right whereas in the past it might have been like 
a measure of this and a bit of that. And now it's like one and a half ounces of this, quarter ounce of that. I do think that there is a difference between the way, um, you know, professionals, and I'm, and I'm just going to say this men approach <laughs> drinks and, and drinking and, you know, versus the way you have the three professional host. drinkers right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the way they write about it too, in that, you know, I, I, I watch as professionals get themselves tied up in knots over, you know, precise proportions or exact ingredients. Or, you know, you, you know, you, I heard you talking earlier about a Manhattan that was shaken and not stirred. Like those things bother you, right? Um, whereas I feel like in the for the home host, it's it's really more part of a a wider system of okay, well. Well, what's the occasion, and what's the meal, and who's going to be there, and and what's going to make it easier to serve Manhattan's to twenty people mm -hmm. when they first arrive for something? Um, and it's less about the technicalities, um, and it go, and it's more about how do you want people to to feel and experience the overall right. occasion. Right. That's that's so funny. That takes me back to like every like buyout or catered event that I've ever worked where you try to apply that very exacting like, all right, it has to be like one and like a, a fat one and a half ounces of Singani or whatever to this. And when 50 people show up and try to get their first round at the same time, like when they arrive at the wedding reception, you kind of got to be like, all right. You know, the exactitude takes a backseat to how yeah. can I get drinks in these right. people's hands faster because they're not going to give a shit if like, oh, yes, the proportions of this are exact. They're going to care whether they have a drink in their hand or not. Right. And I think that that's a, 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 right. a focus that you're right, does get kind of ignored in these very um, um What's the word I'm searching for here? situations, Va maybe? I was going to say vaunted male oh, spaces, yeah, well, you know? <laughs> Yeah, these spaces that are <laughs> that are. Uh, I mean, you and I have talked about this. I'm pretty sure on this show before, Nicola. But just this idea that like something is an unglamorous task as long as women are doing it, but then as soon as men start doing it, it becomes yeah. cool. Look what and I that did applies. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, 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 you can find examples of this all throughout history. I mean, like cooking and cocktails are, are obvious ones, but even I. I stumbled into a talk in a museum about midwifery where it was the same thing. And I think I really startled the poor woman giving this talk as this huge man coming up to her afterwards, very enthusiastically being like the thing that happened in your thing also happened with whiskey, yeah. you know? Um, and it's just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's a, um, it's a phenomenon I think we need to be observant of as we look at these spaces and who we're, celebrating versus who we're not yeah um I agree. well we are coming to the end here and i don't want to uh, go past uh, without mentioning the launch party for your book um mm -hmm. is coming up soon uh, uh it'll be at porch light uh here in new york where they've been doing a lot of great book stuff um i think kind of i think they do one once a month uh, that's how many books come flying out these days um but your book um the Cocktail Parlor will be launching on April 22nd, which is coming up next month pretty quickly. And it's here in town. So I think I'm going to go. Greg, you, you want to go with me? I am going to be in Arizona, unfortunately. That's my last day that I'm going to be at Agave Heritage Fest out there. Well, that's, so that's important. Will, important work you've yeah, got to get some, done. I know. Have some beef jerky for me, unfortunately. I really, really wish I could be there. But I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on a copy of this book. Yeah, me too. I've, it's been – Great hearing about it as it took shape, and I'm just so excited to read it. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so Nicola, anywhere uh, that people can keep up with you a little bit more if they want to uh, find out uh, even more about what goes on in your mind and what what goes on in your research. Yes, uh, feel free to to find me at the hostess diaries dot com mm -hmm, that's, and that's, there you'll find more you'll also find a link to um, to download this uh, free New York City guide as well. Um, as long as you can show that you ordered the book. Oh, right on. Uh, do you have a do you have a shareable map that goes along with it, so we can just <laughs> drop it right into our maps with all the locations? That'd be great. The locations are all in the chapter. Yes. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the Hostess Diaries is your your new blog. And on the blog, I see uh, there's a, um, a clickable button that you can go to your Instagram. So plenty of ways to get in touch with and stay uh, in contact with the good Doctor Nice. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Um, well, we're kind of at the end here, Greg. Do you want to maybe take us out and talk about what's upcoming? 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, next week on the show, uh, we've got Max Reese from Mirate, who's going to be on, which I'm very, very excited about. So stay tuned for that. We're also going to have the full video from this episode up for our regulars on our Patreon page, where we also have a bonus episode from our guest last week, uh, Yuna Asrion, where we talk about some other um, recreational substances behind besides our usual uh, stomping ground here on the speakeasy. So that's a fun one. If you want to check out our Patreon page, link is in the show notes. We'd love to see you over there. Uh, in the meantime, HRN is having their 15 year anniversary. Uh, yes. So be sure to go check out their website, uh, enter for a chance to win dinner at one of 10 cities in the US. Uh, I don't know if Lancaster is on there, but it should be. Um, and just support a network <laughs> that does a ton of great work and has supported food and beverage radio since honestly, podcasting was invented. Yeah. They're OGs in the space and they deserve all the love. So head over there and give them some. But for now, that is going to be it for us this week on The Speakeasy. Thank you so much to Dr. Nicola Nice for coming and talking to us. And until next time, cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. So you don't shun the devil with your right. The Speakeasy is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food and drink radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. 